our Father, thank you for receiving our worship. May you now unpack your word and then prepare us for a new series. And as we want to know how you guide history, we pray in Jesus' name. So today we begin a new series called the Book of Esther. Well, actually a new book called the Book of Esther, which is the beginning of a new series called How God Guides History. Okay, this is the first book. These books will be the books written during the time of the return. Okay, the Jews return. Okay, so let's review the history of Israel and its theme first. Israel was founded at the election and call of Abraham, okay? And then I know that he uh, came out of Ur on the day of Friday, the first month, Nisan 15, 1876 B.C. That's when the promise was given. And then the promise was that God will give him a land, a nation, and a blessing. And the blessing includes the New Testament. New Covenant, okay, which blesses the whole, na all nations, okay. And uh, um, how do I know the date? Well, I'm going to tell from the second one. Israel became a nation leaving Egypt led by Moses, okay. And they came out of Egypt on the day of Friday, the first month, 15th, which is the Passover, and then 1446 B.C. And shortly after, uh, a month and a half later, that's when the law was given. Okay. And uh, um, how do we know this date? Well, this was recorded in the Bible. In uh, Exodus chapter 12, it says they came out of Egypt on the month of Nisan, the 15th day. Okay. And uh, um, according, uh, and by Bible chronology, we calculated it's 1446 B.C. Okay. And that day was a Friday, since I can calculate the lunar you know, days and so on. That day was a Friday. Okay. And then the text says in Exodus 12:40 that the Israelites, comma, who lived, who sojourned in Egypt, comma, came out of Egypt 430 years later, comma, on the same day period. Okay. That is literal translation from the Hebrew. Okay. And, uh, but 450, 430 years after what? Well, I didn't say. <laughs> after they enter Egypt or after, well, some, uh, something else. Okay. Well, the uh, Apostle Paul said in Galatians 3.17, if you want to write down, you can write down. Galatians 3.17, okay? I mentioned Exodus 12.40, okay? And now write down Galatians 3.17, okay? Galatians 3.17. That's when Paul said the law was given 430 years after the promise, okay? And to whom was the promise given? To Abraham. Okay? And in the context, he also mentioned Abraham. Even though somebody said, well, the promise was given to Abraham, but was passed down to Isaac and passed down to, to Jacob, so it could come from Jacob entering Egypt. But you really read in context, Paul was talking about Abraham. Okay? So the promise was given to Abraham when he came out of war. Okay? And then the law was given 430 years later. So I'm going to agree with Apostle Paul rather than today's most of expositors of the Bible or theologians because they want to extend the Bible history as long as possible to try to be close uh, as much possible to the secular history, which they made really long. Okay? <laughs> so I don't think we need to match them because their days are wrong. <laughs> They extended the history, they, they should really shrink it. They, most of the Middle Eastern histories are based on the chronology of Egypt. And Egyptian chronology, we know they have put dynasties that are parallel into linear. And that's why they, they made them longer. They should really make it shorter. Okay? Somewhere up to a thousand years. Okay? So, uh, I believe the Exodus 
for Israel from Egypt and the Exodus for Abraham out of Ur happened on the same day, 430 years apart. Okay, and uh, um, what do the Bi does the Bible mean same day? Well, for the Israelites, the same day means the lunar date, like Nisan 15, plus the weekday. For them, that means the same day. In other words, the Bible recorded two events. Uh, Nisan 15, 1446, and Nisan 15, 1876. And they are claiming that they have the same weekday. Well, that is not something automatic, all right? The lunar days, on which weekday they change, all right? So the Bible made a claim. So let's try to use science to either validate or falsify the Bible record. And guess what happened? He validated, <laughs> which is not surprising, right? It just means when science is right, it agrees with the Bible, <laughs> right? So, uh, so these two days all happen on the Friday, Nisan 15. And Israelites came out of Egypt on a Friday. And they camped twice, that means Friday night and Saturday night. Then they crossed the sea. Okay, so which day was the Red Sea crossing? After Saturday, sun, Friday night, sun, Saturday night, it was in the Sunday. All right, it was Nisan 15 on the third day from the Exodus. Okay, and uh, on the Exodus, on the day of Exodus, Israel gained freedom from slavery by the Egyptians. Right, at the day of the crossing of the Red Sea, it um, experienced death and resurrection, basically, because they're supposed to be dead, right, by the water. But they survived it. God made it a miraculous passage, right? And then Jesus Christ was crucified on Nisan 15 of AD 33, and he's resurrected three days later on a Sunday. So it's, that's Good Friday, there is a Easter Sunday, right? And uh, on Good Friday, Jesus Christ, by his death, paid our debts, so we. The Christians gained the freedom from slavery by sin, right? And then on, on the day of resurrection, Jesus was the first fruit of the resurrection, and we will follow his step. We will gain the same body as he had after that, right? So do you see a similarity? <laughs> and they all happen on the same day, okay? Same lunar date and same weekday. So, does the Bible validate itself here? <laughs> yeah, of course. So, we can see Israel was given a promise. Is Israel, after the Exodus, became a nation and, became, and then was given the law. And then Israel peaked when David became the king um, of both Israel and Judah. Israel means the northern ten tribes, and Judah means southern two tribes. And the division happened before this kingdom split after Solomon's death. Okay. The division happened right after the death of Abimelech, okay. the first illegal official king. Okay. After him, the nation was already divided into southern judges and the northern judges. The southern judges were only religious judges. Uh, there was a high priest, Eli. There was a um, uh, Nazarite, Samson. And there was a prophet um, and Nazarite. Um, Samuel, right? And they are all religious persons. Why? Because the civil authority was, belonged to the occupier, the Philistines. So the south was occupied by the Philistines, okay? And that's why they only have religious judges and the north have civil judges. So the division already happened before. So at the time of uh, Saul, he only united the northern tribes. He never conquered the two southern tribes, okay? It still belonged to the Philistines, and it was David who led these two tribes, Judah and Simeon, to independence. That's why it was an independent nation from the beginning. It was never part of Israel. It was an independent nation, Judah. Okay, so David had to become king of both. He was the king of Judah first, 
and that happens on the seventh month, first day of um, 1010 BC. Okay, and he became the king of Israel seven and a half year later, and uh, on the first month, first day of 1002 BC. Okay, and this time the theme turned into kingdom. Okay, and then after David and Solomon, the glorious uh, United Kingdom, and then it became divided kingdom. Okay, and then the north kingdom was ten tribes, the majority, they fell into exile to Assyria uh, in 723 BC. And the south, two king, uh, tribes in the, um, called Judah, the, they fell uh, to Babylon uh, in three times, 605 uh, 597 and 586. Three prophets were taken at that time, uh, two to Babylon, one to Egypt. And they are Daniel, Ezekiel, and Jeremiah. So this theme now is turning to prophets. The prophets predicted the, the, the judgment, but they also predicted a restoration. Okay, And then how to restore? Well, this is t for the time of exile and return. The Jews, uh, the, that, that means the exile, the Judeans, returned. The Israelites were just lost, but the Jews returned. They are the remnant of all Israel. Okay? And they are expecting total restoration. Okay? And they returned in three batches also. Uh, 534 under the Rubable, um, but they only finished the temple in 515, and 558 under Ezra, and 444 under Nehemiah. And then 444 is the year when the counting started for the 70 weeks of Daniel, okay? So waiting for the coming of the Messiah, okay? So that is Old Testament theme, okay, and history in, in its uh, general structure. Here is a pattern for the history of Israel. I gave you a, a um, complicated one and a simpler one, okay? So you, you choose whatever <laughs> you want to enjoy. Okay. In the complicated one here presented, there are three lines, the thick lines. That means the, the formation or the rise of Israel. The 430 years from the promise uh, to the exodus, okay, to the law, that was uh, the first. That's called the age of promise. Okay. That's from Abraham to Moses. Then there was a 390 year between the slavery, beginning of the slavery to the end of the reign of Abimelech the illegal king, okay? And that's 390 years. And also, from the beginning of the reign of David, no, from the beginning of the uh, conquest to the beginning of the reign of David was also 390 years. So these three are measures of the rise of Israel, okay? The rise, and then there are also the fall of Israel. The fall started counting from Gideon, who was the first uncrowned king. Okay? Because he has the power, he would be responsible for not doing what he's supposed to do. Okay? So from him, the religious sin of Israel was counted for 390 years, except the gap under David and Solomon. They did not allow to do that. And then the, uh, f the, sin of the social sin of Judah in not applying the sabbatical years, okay? that was counted from Gideon also. And uh, uh, it has a gap. 490 years is 70 missing sabbatical years. Okay? And each sabbatical year, you're supposed to forgive debts. Okay? And that is a release of social tension. If you don't do that, you increase social tension, and that is a social sin. Okay? So the, both nations committed both religious and social sins, but they are measured differently. One measured the religious sin, one measured social sin. But they are both committed both. And that's when they do not deserve to exist. Okay, so the end of re the religious, the social sin of Judah, okay, except the gap under David and Solomon, and that is 605 B.C. That's the time of the first um, exile, the first exile. Exactly. Okay, so God has been very precise. Okay, he, he's sovereign king. He's also a good mathematician. Okay, <laughs> he's very precise, and. Uh, um, 605 was the first exile, and the first return was 534. That's 70 years plus one. Okay, so they have 70 years without land. 
and then the fall of the temple was 586, and the restoration of the temple was 515. That's 70 years plus one. So they have 70 years without temple. Okay. So anyway, the, the 70 was fulfilled twice, without land, without temple, all 70. Okay. So that is the bottom of Israel. So Israel, you can see, it's rose and fell. And at the bottom, that's the 70 years. Okay. Um, and, uh, but that's not the end of Israel because God promised a restoration, right? Uh, he promised that in, uh, generally in Ezekiel and then specifically in Daniel. Okay? And uh, um, Daniel gave us the 77s or 70 weeks. Okay? And then that's the restoration. Uh, and then their fall was a crime of 70, uh, 490 years, okay? which is 70 t times seven, right? And the se each seven years is a sabbatical year. And it has a gap under David and Solomon, okay? And then the rest, and, and the punishment was 70, okay? 70 years without land, 70 years without temple. And then the restoration was 490. That's the 70 weeks of Daniel with a gap under Jesus Christ, okay? Because Jesus came when it's almost time for culmination of the Messiah, and he came, but he came at the 69th week, okay? Just one week left, one seven year left. But he gave a different kind of kingdom. He gave the spiritual kingdom in which you have to give the other cheek rather than ruling with a staff. So the Jews said, that's not what we were promised. So they rejected him and therefore the kingdom was given to, the kingdom of heaven was given to the church, which includes all of us from the nations. Okay, but the Jews still have one seven year left for them to suffer for their own sin, then they will repent. They will believe in Jesus. And that's when the, all history ends. Okay, and well, there still will be one thousand year kingdom. So there is a symmetry. Okay, and if you look at the gap, David and Solomon, their names have spiritual, name and identity have spiritual meanings. David simply means the beloved. Okay, and then in Psalm 2, he calls him the son of God. He's supposed to rule over all nations, okay? And the nations should kiss the son or else, <laughs> okay? And, uh, um, and then Solomon, he is the son of David, and he's, his name means the prince of peace, okay? Shalom, okay? Sh Shlomo, shalom, peace, okay? And Jesus Christ, he's all of the above. He is the beloved son of God, son of David, and prince of peace. So you see this perfect symmetry. Again, you see God is no, not only a sovereign God, great mathematician being pre precise, he's also a great uh, geometrist in, in, in being symmetric, right? Yeah, God is just great in every way, right? Okay, and so now let's review the time of exile and return, okay? This is only about Judah, the south, and the Judeans who became the Jew. Israel is gone, it's just about the Jew. Judah and Jews, okay? The exile happening three times, 605, 597, 586. Three prophets were taken, Daniel, Ezekiel, and Jeremiah, okay? The first uh, exile was only a few nobles. The second time was with the king, Jeho Jehoiachin, and the third time the temple was burned. So the exiles basically is increase extent of, of the suffering, right? Or, or the fall, okay, of the nation. Okay. Without the temple, the temple state is gone, right? So the, the return was also in three times, 534, um, 458, and 444. 534 was led by Zerubbabel, and then the later two times by Ezra and Nehemiah. Okay? And then the first time was due to an edict by King Cyrus uh, in 536 BC, two years before they uh, prepared and left. Okay? And uh, after they returned, they immediately built the temple, but they only laid the ground, but it couldn't finish because of the, well, oppressions from outside and greed from within. They used the, the timber for their own house. <laughs> and uh, um, uh, in the year 520 BC, uh, that, uh, that year, in that year, um, because two prophets spoke, Haggai and Zechariah sp spoke, saying God wants you to finish the temple, and then the people s restarted the project. They wrote a letter to King uh, Darius the first, or Darius the first of Persia, asking um, whether 
there was a edict before from Cyrus, and they confirmed. So they restart the project in 520, and they finish it in 515. Okay, and that's exactly 70 years plus one. You know, uh, and then after that, in 474 to 473, I I write there in your printout wrong. In the BC, you write the bigger number first. Okay, so 474 slash three. Okay. Not 473 slash 4. Okay. 474 slash 3. Yeah. It's right on there. Yeah, I corrected it because of the first service. You know, <laughs> I've discovered it. Uh, so 474 slash 3, that's the year uh, when Esther events happen, a whole year from Nisan to Nisan. Okay. And uh, that's during King Xerxes I or Ahasuerus, according to Hebrew pronunciation. Then the two uh, um, returns were led by Ezra and Nehemiah. The one by Ezra was due to an edict by King Artaxerxes I in 459 BC, this year before the return, because they're returning the first month. Okay, the, the edict have to be a year before for them to prepare. The last time it took two years, this time maybe one year, because it has 5,000 men plus children, plus the gold and silver that they carry. You know, it takes time to prepare. Okay. And the third time, 444 BC, led by Nehemiah, was due to another edict by Artaxerxes I in 444 BC. This time, the edict and the return happened the same year, because it's just a few people, okay. uh, Nehemiah and the, his guards. Okay. So uh, I if you want to say the three returns, you can write this down, the three returns, what were they for? The first return was for the temple. The second return was for the law. The third return was for the wall. Okay, the temple, the law, and the wall. Okay, three returns are for for three things for restoration. Okay, okay, and in a bigger picture, uh, we have the the in the background the Gentile empires began uh, four from prophesied by Daniel. The first was Neo Babylonia. Uh, that's the discipline for uh, Judah. And then it was Medo-Persia, that's the restoration, the return. Okay? So the three captivities and three returns all happened during this period. After that, there's Greece, Rome, and then, uh, Rome, the, in Greece, it's a persecution by a little horn, uh, which is a little antichrist. In Rome, it's confrontation okay, between, well, the pagan empire and the uh, and Israel, <laughs> but later the role returned. Rome became Christian, and then Jews became the Antichrist faction. And then until at the, at the end in the tribulation, when the Jews will be turned again. Okay, so this is the big picture. Okay, but uh, at the end, of course, you have another little horn. Uh, that's the major antagonist, which is the Antichrist. Okay, so that's the big picture. And now we are dealing with just the Persian Medo-Persian Empire. Okay. The Medo-Persian Empire only have one king from Media. He was called Darius the Mede, okay. uh, or his secular name was uh, Syak Cyrus II. Uh, and uh, uh, the, right after him, he ruled only two years. Right after him, Cyrus uh, the Great, he ruled for seven years. And after that, it was uh, Cambyses the Second, then Darius the First, the Great, and. And then he was Xerxes the first, who is Ahasuerus, the husband, the husband of um, Esther. Okay, so the thing, the book of Esther, talked about happened in 474 slash 3 B.C. during the time of Xerxes the first. Okay, now let's talk about the books written during the exile and return. During the exile, which are the three, okay, 605, 597, 584. The first book written then, uh, during that, was Lamentation, uh, because the fall of Jerusalem happened in 584. So let's say this was written circa 580, okay? And it was on the destruction of the temple, at uh, the first temple. Then it was Ezekiel, about 10 years later, circa 570. It was God's plan to rebuild the, the temple, okay? So whatever the second and the third, uh, I, I believe, um, um, Ezekiel just prophesied the the end time temple, okay, and uh, um, 
The second temple was built simple, but Herod the Great, thinking he was the Messiah, possibly, so he expanded that temple. I think he built it according to the third temple's image, because he thought he was the Messiah. <laughs> he came at a certain time, you know. Uh, correct pr prediction if you come from the different edicts. Okay, so he built it as the potential third temple, but it was not, so it was um, destroyed right after it was finished. Okay, and but there will be a third temple later. Okay, and Jeremiah was written about another ten years later, five circa five sixty B.C. is about how Israel and Judah came down, and then Daniel about another thirty years later, circa five thirty B.C. was how Israel and Judah will be restored. Say, so, so the temple destroyed, the temple rebuilt. Israel came down, Israel rebuilt. Okay, so these are the four books during the time of exile. And then the during the time of return are six books. This is, will be our series on how God turns history. Because it's the bottom of history for Israel, right? How he turns around to the restoration. Okay? The first was written by uh, Haggai, 520 BC, on rebuilding the temple. Uh, and uh, Ze Zechariah, uh, about the same time on the temple, and uh, all the way till the end time. And Esther, circa 470 B.C., the plan to stop the restoration by ha Haman was stopped by God. Okay, and how did God stop it? Was he mentioned at all in the book of Esther? He wasn't. But was he behind every turn of events? Yes, he was. So expect this way, that God governs all history, not necessarily explicitly, most of the time not, but... He is the one who directs history, okay, behind every turn of events, okay. And uh, uh, so we're going to choose this book as kind of the flag for this series, okay. This is how God does things. And then Ezra, uh, circa 450 B.C., about 20 years later, about the first return and the second return. So we're going to teach Ezra in two batches, the first return first, then we're going to do the two books on, uh, on building the temple, and then the second return, uh, the second half of Ezra, then Nehemiah and the third return. Okay? And then Malachi, uh, about 400 B.C., is about the sorry state of the returnees. Yes, they obeyed God. They were faithful. They returned. But were they really faithful to God spiritually? No. <laughs> They were complainers, and they were selfish people. They were um, oppressing others, and they were in a sorry state. What do they need for a total restoration? They need redemption, and they need the Messiah, and they need the Holy Spirit. And so that's why at the end of Malachi, it points to the coming of the Son of Righteousness, the the really the S-U-N, son of righteousness, which turned out to be the S-O-N, the son of righteousness. Okay, it's pointing to Christ. So that will be a good series, okay? Talking about the books written during the return. Okay, so we t take out Esther first as a flagship, a time for this. Okay, now let's get into the book of Esther. Okay, the book of, name, the book of Esther was named after one of its major characters, Queen Hadasha-Esther of King Xerxes I, or Ahasuerus, of the Persian Empire. Hadasha is uh, the Hebrew name, which means a, a, a tree uh, uh, that blossoms in spring and has pink flowers. I don't remember what is the English name for it. Um, what is the one that we do? Usually we cut into different shapes. Uh, my home has several of them. Huh? No, <laughs> that's in the house, out, out of the house. Um, but anyway, that, that's a tree, okay? It's, it's a, I don't remember Chinese, but forgot the English name. I'll find out for you. Esther was, his, was her kind of popular name, pagan name, okay? Esther really is Ishtar, okay? The queen of heaven, okay? Um, you know, kind of being Roman, live as a Roman, you know? Um, and uh, um, the name was consistently the same in the Masoretic text, MT, in the Septuagint, LXX, and in the Vulgate, uh, which is Latin and in modern Bibles. The name was never changed. Okay. About the author's source and date of compilations, 
the um, the author was anonymous. Okay, so he didn't say. Uh, he was likely a Jew who lived during the Medo Persian Empire, which was between 539, the conquest of Babylon by Cyrus, and 331, the conquest of Persia by Alexander the Great. Okay? So he understood in detail the Persian customs. For example, the, first, the kings of Persia after Darius I always had seven friends of the king. And the law in Persia that the edict of the kings uh, cannot be reversed. And the pageant of selecting a queen in Persia involves a 12-month process of cleansing the body. So these are uh, traditions, customs of Persian Empire that was ancient and it was confirmed in secular sources, but this author knew all of these details. So that's why he likely lived in the same time. Okay. And uh, he also knew about the origin of the Jewish festival Purim. And the Jewish tradition, therefore, attributed the authorship to Mordecai. It may be so, it may not be. But if it was really written by Mordecai, it was edited in the 10th chapter. Because it, in 10.2 it says, when he was so-and-so, he was not first person, okay, third person, right? So that somebody else wrote at least the 10th chapter. Okay, so and that's uh, possible. Okay, it, remember the Genesis was uh, edited later, like updating the, the the toponyms, the name of the places, to later names, like calling Dan, uh, Dan, which was named so after the conquest, right? Before it was called Laish. Okay, uh, so they they changed the names, and, and but that's later editing. It doesn't change the origin original date. You know, was ancient. Okay, and uh, so this is possible. So I would say it's possible written by Mordecai for the first nine chapters, and then some editor later added the tenth chapter. Okay, uh, like uh, we say Moses wrote Deuteronomy, but what about his death? Did he write that? Somebody would say, well, he by faith he wrote that before his death. Well, uh, well, that's possible. That's a little uh, kind of unlikely. So I, I don't mind saying, well, Joshua wrote that. Okay, so. It doesn't violate the whole book. It was mainly wrote by Moses, right? So um, that's what I believe in. Okay, so I think, yes, we can accept Mordecai wrote most of Esther. The source was most likely pers uh, personal experience through oral history, and the date of compilation was probably 5th through 4th century B.C. And since this event happened in 474 slash 3 BC, we can say this was written s circa 470 BC. Okay, so that's how we arrived at this. Okay, now let's uh, talk about the position in the canon. In the Masoretic text, okay, or the Hebrew Bible, it was uh, formed in 400 BC under the general editorship of Ezra. Okay, but it went through three more editorial committees, and the last one was 8090, okay, around 100, and that was the, the, the rabbis after 8070, and they discussed whether or not they should keep that, uh, Esther and uh, the Song of Solomon in the canon. It was already there, but they discussed whether they should keep it, because Esther didn't mention God at all, and then, um, and the Song of Solomon seems kind of fleshly, talking about love, you know, and so on. But so they, they decide to keep them, okay? And they made up some strange reasons to keep them, okay? They said, okay, that love in Song of Solomon was between, was a passionate love between Yahweh and Israel, so we must keep it, okay? Well, in reality, it's about a man and a woman. It may imply something between I Yahweh and Israel and Christ and the church, okay? But it, it was not the original meaning, right? But anyway, I'm glad they kept it, right? So similarly, they, they discussed about Esther, but they also kept it, okay? And uh, um, in, in the Hebrew Bible, Esther was one of the five books in the Megillot, and, uh, which is called the Five Scrolls. And the Megillot is a part of the uh, writings, and the writings is a third part of the Tanakh, okay, which is Torah, Nevi'im and Ketuvim, okay, taking the first three letters, Tanakh, 
okay, the law, the prophets, and the writings. So here is a chart of the Bible uh, in the Masoretic text. Okay, the Torah is a scripture. Okay, that's the five books uh, of Moses. The Nevi'im, the prophets, including two parts. The early prophets is what we call history, and the later prophets is what we call the prophets today. Okay, uh, and then the, in the writings there are three parts: uh, the poetry of wisdom, and the Megillot, and the history. Okay, which includes Daniel. So the only prophet book that was not in the prophets was Daniel, because Daniel was kind of half history, half prophecy. So it, they chose to put in the in the history part. It could be put in either place. Okay, uh, uh, I think they put it in because it was written late. Okay, and uh, the the Megillot were actually selected out of the original positions uh, for. Uh, ceremonial readings on five Jewish feasts, okay? and uh, so that was done later, after the I think eighty one hundred, <laughs> okay, and uh, and before it, it was um, just two parts in Ketuvim, and the Ruth used to be a um, at the time of Jesus Christ, okay, according to the uh, the writings of Josephus. The Old Testament only have 22 books, okay, the same number as the Hebrew alphabet. Okay. To achieve that, you have to assign Ruth as a appendix for Judges and Song of Solomon and Ecclesiastes after Proverbs, and Lamentation as appendix of Jeremiah, and Esther was probably with history. Okay. So anyway, there were some change of order, but uh, the content wasn't changed. Okay, so in the uh, Septuagint, okay, which was translated in the 400-year span from 200 BC to 8200, okay, and the Vulgate that was a Latin translation done in 8400. In them, it was the Esther was the last one of the 12 books of history, okay, and uh, of course history is the second part of the Old Testament, okay, and here is a chart of the the Bible as Septuagint, which is basically what our order is today. Okay, uh, it has Pentateuch, history, poetry, wisdom, and prophets. Interestingly, the Chinese we order our classics in this f order: first, scripture, Jing, then history, Shi, then the teachers like the prophets, that Zi, okay, and then the collections. That's how the Chinese order our classics, okay? And it agrees with the Jewish way of organizing the uh, the Tanakh, you see? <laughs> and then in the LXX, they shift the last two, okay? So it's a scripture, history, collection, and the teachers. So our modern Bible follow the Greek mind in LXX, okay? But the Chinese agreed with the Hebrew mind. <laughs> Because we were all what, Orientals, right? So anyway, interesting, isn't it? Yeah. I don't know why, but I just find that it's interesting. Okay, so now let's talk about the Book of Esther. Okay, its purpose, theme, and message. The major purpose of the author was to instruct the Jewish readers on the origin of the Feast of Purim, commanding them to observe it year by year. The th the theme of the book was God's faithfulness in preserving his people in the hostile environment, even for those who were not faithful enough to return to the promised land, like Esther and Mordecai. Remember, they, God told the Jews to go back, and Esther and Mordecai were not among the faithful to go back. They were actually the unfaithful who loved the foreign country that they were exiled in. And they didn't go back. But does God use imperfect people to bless his faithful? Did he ever do that before? Is he doing it now? Hopefully. Right? So God does use imperfect rulers to bless his faithful people. Okay. Now, uh, the, uh, rather than disciplining them, 
who didn't return, God used them to preserve the lives of all Jews, including the obedient ones who returned to Judea. So without Esther and Mordecai, they would have been eradicated by Haman. Everywhere in the, in the empire, all the Jews would have been eradicated. Okay. But they were preserved through Esther and Mordecai. The message of the book is the evil forces of the world that work through the enemies of Israel could never succeed in destroying the people of God. God will always preserve a remnant until all his promises were fulfilled. Okay. Now about interpretive issues. Okay. Haman, the per, uh, persecutor of Israel in the history of Esther, was an Agagite. Okay. And if we make the connection, we find him as a descendant of Agag, the king of Amalekites at the time of Saul. And the Amalekites was an enemy of Israel, the first nation who attacked Israel after the Exodus. Remember when, when Israel came out of Egypt, the first nation attacked them was Amalek. Okay? And not only from front, they actually attacked them from behind, attacking the women and children. So that's why they are really low in moral. Okay? And, uh, also, it's possible that the Amalekites are the descendants of Amalek, a grandson of Esau, whose descendants, the Edomites, were perennial enemies of Israel. Okay? And then the struggle between the brothers of Jacob and Esau, we can see, continued throughout the ages. So, uh, uh, and the, the, the conflict kind of uh, went to peak. The last major battle was between uh, Israel, uh, Herod the Great, an Edomian or Edomite king of the Jews, and baby Jesus, the quintessential Israel. You see, Matthew 2 uh, used a verse uh, from uh, Hosea, Ho Hosea, okay? Um, from Egypt I called out my son. That was used on Israel, but now it was used on Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is the one true Israelite. Okay? Israel used to be the nation, the, the nation through whom God will bless the other nations. When you bless Israel, you are blessed by God. Israel was the channel okay? in the Old Testament time. But when Israel itself became rebellious and they, they got stuck, the grace cannot pass through them, God replaced Israel by Jesus, one true Israelite through whom God will bless all nations. And now how do you get blessed by God? By blessing the name of Jesus. Then you're blessed by God. Okay, this is different mode. Okay. Now, the, uh, the slaughter of the infants in Bethlehem probably happened during March 12th and 13th, 4 BC, which was Adar 13th to 14th, 5 Nisan year, 5 N BC. The, so five, five, the Nissan starts from March, okay, March or April, around April 1st, okay. Uh, so it ends in the next year, right? So 5 BC ends in 4 BC, right? In, in the 12th month, which is the end of the 5 BC, okay, Nissan year, is in 4 BC, okay, it's in March. And uh, um, when there, there was a lunar eclipse in that night, okay, and uh, uh, shortly before the death of Herod the Great, uh, which was between Nisan 1st and Nisan 14th. He, he died in the month of Nisan, but before the uh, Passover. Okay. So the, the bloody moon happening that night was prophesied already by Joel, who said the sun will darken and the moon will turn into blood, right? And the moon turning to blood happened shortly after the birth of Jesus, and the sun da was darkened on the day of death of Jesus. Okay. So end time, in, the, in a sense, already begun from the time of Christ, okay. first coming. Okay. So therefore, the Feast of Purim, was, as recorded in the book of Esther, was one of the minor feasts, that is Purim and Hanukkah, Hanukkah two of them, that prophesied about the birth of Christ. Hanukkah is about the... Um, Christmas, okay. uh, and uh, Purim was about the slaughter of infants, okay, and uh, uh, the uh, the f spring feasts, there are four spring feasts prophesied the first coming of Christ, and the four fall feasts prophesied the second coming of Christ, that's eight major feasts 
plus two minor feasts. There are only ten. Okay? The two minor feasts about the birth of Christ. Okay? So all of these connections are possible, even likely, okay? even though they are not necessary. Here's a chart of the battle of the brothers. Okay? In the 18th century BC, it was Esau versus Jacob. In 15th century, Amalek versus Israel. 11th century, Agag versus Saul. And the 9th century, Edomites versus Israelites. 5th century, Haman versus Jews. 1st century, it was Herod the Great versus Jesus Christ. And then it turned from physical to spiritual. Herod Agrippa I versus the early church. So the early church became the Israel side, okay? While the Jews turned into the, <coughs> the Edomite side, okay? And later, the Judaism versus Christianity and Satanic Jews uh, at the end time, Satanic Jews versus Torah Jews, okay, which is the, um, will be at the time of the tribulation. Okay, about literary features. One significant fe uh, feature is the abundance of feasts. There are ten mentioned in this book. There are three couplets, uh, one I couplet in the beginning, one in the middle, and one in the end. That actually formed the structure of the book. The two fastings seem to have led to the eternal establishment of the Feast of Purim. Okay. Another feature is the abundance of doublets. Okay. There are three couplets of feasts, two lists of servants, two uh, efforts of hiding Esther's Jewish identity, two gathering of women for Xerxes, two courts in the harem, two fastings, two talks of Haman with his wife and friends, Twice Esther met the king without permission. Mordecai was elevated twice in rank. Haman covered or was covered his face twice. The ten sons of Haman were mentioned twice. The eunuchs uh, Harbona met, uh, appeared twice. Two edicts are mentioned. The anger of the king was appeared uh, twice. Uh, well, appeared twice. Twice it was mentioned that the law of Persia cannot be changed. The law has two days for revenge. Uh, two letters were written to ask the Jews to observe the Feast of Purim, and the king offered half of his kingdom to Esther twice. So you see so many doublets. Why? Well, because there's so many ethereal things. Remember when Joseph interpreted the dreams, what happened? How many dreams? How many times did the dreams appear? always twice, right? <laughs> the baker, the, um, what is it? The, 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 yeah, the, the sword, uh, and then the, um, the king, right? It's always twice. Why? Because these things are too ethereal. They're unreal. So a repetition made them real. This book, God was not mentioned. He's ethereal. He's behind. He's not, he doesn't appear to be there because he's dealing with unfaithful people. And pagans, right? These are not religious people. But is he behind everything? Yes. How do you know he's behind? How do, can you be certain? Because of these doublets. Everything important appeared twice in this book. Okay. So uh, the third feature of the book is the absence of the names of God or religious activities like prayer, worship, or sacrifice. The many apparent co coincidences in the story carry the message that there are no co coincidences at all. When God seems to be absent, he is actually in control behind every scene. Coincidences? Let me give you a list. Esther was made queen before the time of the persecution. Haman was the descendant of Agag, Amalek, Esau, a traditional enemy of the Jews. Haman was uh, through the lot so that a year-long process was given for reactions for the plot to eradicating the Jews. Mordecai discovered a plot and saved the king's life. The king failed to sleep until he found that Mordecai saved his life. And um, Haman was the one who was made to honor Mordecai publicly. And Esther did not confront Haman until after the king honored Mordecai. And Haman made a, gal uh, a gallow for Mordecai, but it was used for himself. And the king returned just in time to see that Haman was uh, uh, seemed to be molesting the queen. So, so many coincidences. Were they coincidences at all? None, okay? So the structure finally was grouped around three couplets of feasts, as I already mentioned. Two feasts of a king, Ahasuerus, um, at the beginning, 
which happened in 483, 482 BC. That was to prepare for the invasion of Greece, which he failed. He came back, he was depressed, so he went into womanizing, so he had this, uh, um, this selection of beautiful girls for his new queen. And then uh, two feasts of Queen Esther in the middle, and then two days of Feast of Purim at the end, which these two happened in 474, 473 BC. That's the eventful day. Okay, and uh, yeah, when I studied chronology, or I discovered that was also one eventful day in astro astronomical structure of the calendars. It's just interesting. You know, I, I used to think that things happen in heaven shouldn't, that's scientific, it shouldn't relate with spiritual things, because that's kind of like astrology, okay? But I mean, God can use those things to mean things on the earth. And apparently this was one. It happened in a year that significant in astronomy. And uh, uh, it was a turn of history. Okay, so it's really at the bottom for Israel and then this turn around okay, in the restoration. God our Father, thank you for giving us uh, a wonderful beginning for entering a series of books, I mean this book, Esther in studying how you turn things around in history. You are great, you are good, you are behind everything. You do not appear explicitly in every time, but we have the faith because of your word that you are in control of everything. So even though there are times when we should despair, we can actually have faith and demonstrate the life of Christ in us. We pray in Jesus' name.